Today, I want to share, share really a part two, uh, which is actually message number four in our series on uh, family. We've been, uh, last week I talked to, to you about parenting, and the week before we talked about part A of this message that I want to bring to you today, a marriage made in heaven. And if you uh, didn't get the first part of that, I want to invite you to go on our website. You can pick it up there. In that first uh, message, I talked about four major marriage malfunctions. And uh, today I want to finish up uh, this whole uh, uh, idea of marriage designed by God, made in heaven, and uh, some requirements that the Scripture gives us about that. Just a few years ago, the Chicago Tribune reported that there was a startup company, I don't know if it still exists, uh, but a startup company in Seattle, Washington, that uh, had advertised that they will help you fund your wedding up to $10,000. And now that sounds uh, pretty good with the escalating prices of everything, in particular wedding cost. And uh, uh, you're a young couple here today, or you're listening on live stream or television or radio, you may be saying, where do I sign up for that? But there is a catch. There is a catch to the whole thing, of course, you would assume. And that is, here's the catch. They'll give you $10,000 if you qualify. They meet with you and they counsel first and they do a profile of uh, uh, both uh, of the individuals in the relationship. And then they assign an interest rate to that $10,000 based on the profile they come up with with the couple. In other words, what are the probabilities that this marriage will last? And so they do the profile, and then based on that, they say, okay, here's $10,000, and your interest rate on that is whatever the profile determines best. Now, here's the deal. Uh, you don't have to pay that $10,000 back if your marriage survives at least 25 years. But if, you, if, it, if it goes belly up six months to 25 years, you have to pay it back in full with the assigned amount of interest. And uh, so the deal is your marriage tragedy becomes somebody else's gain because they'll take that money and then reinvest it in another couple. And uh, according to the spokesman, uh, the name of the company is Swan Love, Swan Love. And the reason they named it Swan Love was because, listen to this, swans mate for life. So their goal, their stated goal, is to, to support what they call everlasting marriage. They're for long-term marriage, but they're also betting that, that uh, in many couples it's just not going to work, and that's their business model that many uh, uh, and perhaps most uh, marriages will break up, and that's where they'll make their money. Well, unfortunately, the statistics today tend to support that their bet uh, may just pay off for them, and that's a tragic thing. But how do we change those stats? Well, I believe the only way you can do that is by doing marriage God's way. Uh, marriage was made in heaven. It was designed by God, as we've talked about in previous uh, messages. But there are some requirements. If you want uh, a marriage that works, there are some requirements, and God's Word has given us that. If you're physically able to do so, why don't you stand with me as we honor the reading of God's Word, beginning in Ephesians 5, verse 21. Paul writes, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Remember that. We're going to come back to that. Verse 22, wives, submit to your own husband, husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body." Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects 
her husband. Father, would you take now your word, help us, Father, not just to hear information, but make application, Father, of the truths and principles that you have given us for how to make marriage work the way you designed it. Would you speak to our hearts? Would you uh, transform us, convict us, challenge us? And Father, most of all, cause us to be changed when we leave today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Now, the first thing I'd say to you about this uh, passage this morning is it is a very unwoke scripture passage in today's world. And even in some of our churches, unfortunately. Why is that? Well, simply put, it's because it uses masculine and feminine pronouns for husbands and wives. But the fact is, much of the confusion in our culture today over what marriage is and the poor state of the institution of marriage in our culture today is simply the result of ignoring what God has said about marriage. And as we talked two weeks ago, God is the creator of marriage. He has designed it, and so he has the final word on the subject. And this passage given to us in the book of Ephesians it reflects God's settled design. And it is settled even if the world around us tries to change the terms and the rules and the definitions. This is what God has said. You know, you've heard perhaps the old line some years ago where someone would say, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. Well, the fact is, when God says it, that settles it. It's not about whether you believe it. I hope you do. But when God says it, it's final. And God has said it. And His Word is settled about it. Over the years, I've seen a lot of couples and a lot of marriages in trouble. And I've noticed that many married couples are living in the same house but are not living together. In fact, I had a couple that I counseled with many years ago when I pastored down in Florida, and they had literally, literally divided the house up. And he had one half, she had the other half. The only common room, can you imagine what the only common room was? The kitchen. They had made an agreement that they could both use the kitchen, but they lived separately in the same house. It was bizarre. And I've seen that. I, I've seen it sometimes where it's the wife, sometimes it's the man, sometimes it's both. My friend, marriage is hard work, and it always requires energy, and you can never stop working at it, and you can never quit or give up on it if you want to have a marriage that works. And that's why today I want to show you three things from our passage that I, I believe you have to keep working at. You have to keep working at all through your marriage, uh, three things that are required uh, to help your marriage thrive. What are they? Well, number one, I want you to note in verses 21, really through 24, Marriage requires loving submission. Verse 21, he says, submitting to one another. Hang on to that thought. We'll look at that in just a moment. And then in verse uh, uh, 23, he tells the wives to submit uh, to the husband. Now, now, this first requirement of marriage that's made in heaven, a marriage that thrives, is one of the most misunderstood, misrepresented, and misused truths in all of the Scripture by those who do not know God or those who do not know His Word. But if you get this requirement right, you will get a powerful, God-given principle for a successful marriage. You see, marriage is an edifice that is built by God. It is uh, uh, in this design of His that He has made assignments, assigned responsibilities to the man, to the wife. And understanding that is the first major step towards succeeding in your marriage. This is not about chain of command. This is about lines of responsibility. And it has, again, in our culture, the dreaded S word. What is it? Submission. Submission is despised by much of our culture today. And the idea of submission in marriage by the woman is often interpreted by those outside and even some inside the family of God to mean that a woman has no opinion, she has no voice uh, in the relationship, and is to live out her life in quiet compliance to whatever her husband demands. That's not what Paul is teaching, and that's not what Paul's message is. So let me begin by debunking the misuse of these words submitting and submit. Let me clarify something, by the way. Let me just make sure you understand. Submission and abuse are not the same thing. So our culture sometimes confuses those and tries to suggest that if someone is submitting, they're being abused. That's not what I'm talking about. And we're not talking about just passively 
uh, ignore abuse. Not, not at all. So don't hear that. That's not what's being discussed. And that's not what Paul's talking about. But he says, wives, submit to your husbands in verse 22. The word submit in the Greek means to voluntarily place yourself under the authority of another person. Uh, it is a voluntary act. Now, I want to tell you that every person who is of a carnal nature will rebel against this. Every wife who doesn't understand the Word of God says, I'm not going to submit myself to anybody or anything. I'm a person. I'm going to have my way. And the more a person thinks like the ways of the world, the more they're going to refuse to submit to the Word of God. You say, well, right, Pastor, but you don't know my husband. Well, that may be true, but God does. And you're not responsible for how your husband responds. You're responsible for how you respond to God. And by the way, ladies, if your husband is not a believer, your submission in marriage might actually be an instrument in God's hand. Listen to what Peter wrote in 1 Peter 3 and verse 1. He says, In the same way, you wives, be submissive to your own husbands, so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives. Now, there are men listening to this right now, and they're going, <laughs> that's right, preacher. <laughs> Preach it, brother. It's about time. Well, if that's you, you just hang on for a minute. I'm going to get to you. And by the way, let me just say, I think the burden on the man is far greater than it is on the woman. But just hang on. Did you notice verse 21 we started off with? It looks like a break in the, the context, but I, I think it is the verse 22 and following is a continuation of this idea where Paul says that submission is not just for the woman. Submission is a Christian idea. Submission is for Christians. And that verse in verse 21 instructs us to submit to one another. Paul's message is that God expects the role of the husband to be the family leader, which enables submission and respect from his wife. It's a mutual kind of thing. The man's not to be a dictator nor a master, but a godly and trusted leader that not only receives submission from his wife, but also enables her to willingly follow his leadership. The word submission actually is a military term. It means to line up in, in rank, uh, to be under the authority of. Dr. Ed Young uh, says this. He says, a wife then who is submissive to her husband is not saying in any way that she is inferior to him in intellect, wisdom, insight, or reason. The word relates more to function than it does status. And in the home, God places the weight of responsibility and accountability squarely on the shoulders of the man. Now, there are a couple of words that help give us some perspective about the message going on. The first is reverence, and it's used, by the way, um, in uh, verse 21. Did you notice that? Submission is actually an expression of reverence. Listen, ladies, when you submit to your husband, that's not an expression of reverence to him. And uh, uh, men, when you mutually submit, it's not a, a, an act of reverence toward her. Submission is an act of reverence toward God. Submission is a, a recognizing who all of us are to submit to. And it kind of debunks the idea that husbands and wives are to be self-assertive with each demand uh, and each getting uh, their own way in everything. Submission in marriage is an act of reverence for Jesus. Think of it, always think of it that way. Both sides, men and women, I'm submitting, I'm doing, I'm carrying out my role, I'm carrying out my responsibilities as an act of reverence for Jesus not as an act of rights or privilege. The second word is respect. Look at verse uh, 33 it is, or uh, I guess it is, yeah, verse 33 where Paul says, uh, and why, see to it uh, that the wife respects her husband. Wives respect your husband. Your husband needs your esteem. It means you, you respect the role that God has placed him in, in your life and in your family. You are to respect his spiritual leadership in that role. And so reverence and respect are key words to helping us understand the whole idea of what it means to be submissive in the marriage relationship. Submission by the wife is an act of reverence to God, and respect is an acknowledgement of God's marriage structure. That's important for us to understand. 
But God has a second requirement for a marriage that's made in heaven. We see it in verses 25 and 28, and that is that marriage requires a loving sacrifice. It requires loving sacrifice. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Have you ever heard of the seven stages of a married cold? The seven stages of a married cold. First year, sugar dumpling. I'm really worried about my baby girl. You've got a bad sniffle, and there's no telling about these things with all the strep throat that's going around. I'm putting you in the hospital this afternoon for a general checkup and good rest. That's year one. Second year. Listen, darling, I don't like the sound of that cough, and I've called Doc Miller to rush over here. Now, you go to bed and be a good girl. Do that for me, would you? That's second year. Third year, maybe you better lie down, honey. Nothing like a little rest when you feel lousy. I'll bring you something. Have we got any canned soup? Fourth year. Now look, dear, be sensible. After you fed the kids, got the dishes work uh, done, and, and finished the floor, then why don't you go lie down? Fifth year, why don't you just take a couple of aspirin? <laughs> Sixth year, I wish you'd gargle or something instead of, si- <laughs> instead of sitting around barking like a seal all evening. <laughs> Seventh year, for Pete's sake, stop sneezing. Are you trying to give me pneumonia? Well, marriage requires loving sacrifice, doesn't it? Now, man, I told you to hang on. Why? Well, because I do really believe that the heavier burden is upon us. We're to love our wives, the Bible says, like Christ loved the church. You see, the role of a man in marriage is to love his wife so much that he would give himself up for her. That's sacrificial. But but how do we... How do we give it a a real understanding of sacrificial love? Well, if you really want a portrait of sacrificial love, you have to look and see the greatest demonstration of that of all time. That was Christ himself. You know, Christ calls his church his bride, and he says one day he's come for his bride. We are his bride. So if you want to know what sacrificial love looks like in marriage, you have to look at how Christ has treated and continues to treat his church. He treats her with compassion. He treats her with forgiveness. He treats her with unconditional love. He treats her with grace. He provides her with security. He hears her prayers. He speaks to her heart. That's how Jesus deals with his bride. And so if you want to know how sacrificial love looks, look at how Jesus responds to his bride, the church, to you and to me. Now, guys, if you get that, if you understand that, you're going to see your wife begin to respond to your leadership on a completely different level. And the sacrificial love that Paul's talking about is not a giving in kind of love. That's a negotiated kind of love. It's uh, I'll give in, I'll do, if you'll do. That's a negotiated. Paul's not talking about a giving in kind of love. What Paul is talking about is a giving up kind of love. A A love that's unconditional. You know, you've heard this before, well, marriage is 50 50. No, it's not. A a marriage is 50-50 will always be negotiating. Marriage is 100 and 100. you got to put 100% in. And you say, well, I put 100% in, but my spouse only put 50% in. You're not responsible for their response. You're responsible for your response. Now, I hope it changes, but don't believe for an instant that marriage is 50-50. And if you get this, you'll learn what unconditional, sacrificial love is all about. And If husbands and wives are one flesh, as we see it repeated here from Genesis chapter 2 in this passage, repeated, if they are one flesh, when you hurt the other, you hurt yourself. So to love a man uh, that loves his wife sacrificially, cherishes her and honors her just like Christ cherished and honored his church. Because, as he says here, no one ever hated his own flesh. And if the two are one flesh, guess what? When she hurts, I hurt. When he hurts, I hurt. It's symbiotic. A husband who loves sacrificially will be loved and will be the leader of his home. Too many men today have abdicated 
their leadership in the home because simply they have uh, refused to love sacrificially. Now, if you want a meaningful marriage, you're going to have to stop thinking about the passage that we've looked at today the way the world thinks about it. Hello? You're going to have to quit reading this passage and say, well, this doesn't sit well in the world. It's not for the world. Paul was writing to believers. Now, it works in the world, but you've got, to, you've got to stop looking at this the way the world interprets this and the way the world thinks about this. To the world, submission is a put-down. But to God, in marriage, it's an act of wisdom and beauty. To the world, sacrifice is an act of weak leadership. But to God, in marriage, it is an act of Christ-like character and strength. And so, we are to love sacrificially. What gives us perspective? Well, let me share three words that I think will give you perspective on sacrificial love. The first is service. Serve. The husband's first responsibility is to be a servant leader. Men, you are to be a servant leader in your home. You see, men, we often think about leadership as being something up front, out ahead, or making all the calls and the decisions. But we rarely think of it as giving up or as surrendering or serving or elevating others. But that's exact, the exact model that Jesus Uh, gives to us is to be servant leaders and to be servant leaders is to be like Christ and to do that we serve those in our own home our own family our wives our uh, our spouses the second word that gives us perspective about this sacrificial kind of love is secure husbands you're to create a secure place where the wife can thrive without fear a place where she feels safe she feels like she can be who God wants her to be because you've created and you've protected that kind of environment. A third word is sustain. Husbands, third, you are to make every effort to sustain your home and marriage by providing for your, the needs of your wife. That's sustenance. I know there are seasons where things go awry, and we understand that, but the big picture is your goal is to serve, to secure, and to sustain your home, and your relationship. I think Adrian Rogers some years ago said it best when he said the major problem in America today is not feminism and rebellious wives. It is instead slacker husbands who are not doing what God has called them to do. Men, this is what God has called you to do. But I want to tell you something. No man can be the head of his home, much less his marriage, if he's not under the headship or the lordship of of Christ and uh, under his anointing and his power. Years ago, when I was young in ministry, oh, four decades ago, but I would do uh, a premarital counseling with, uh, with young couples, and they would come in, and, and I would say, now, it's important that Jesus be Lord of your home. And that is true. We'd all agree with that. Nobody's going to differ about that. But in my counsel, I would just say, make sure Jesus is Lord of, of, of your home. But uh, as the years progressed, I began to realize that wasn't the best counsel. What I I, I began to do and how I began to change my counsel with them would be, Jesus needs to be Lord of your life. So to the man, Jesus needs to be Lord of your life. He needs to be uh, your pursuit. And to the woman, Jesus needs to be Lord of your life. He needs to be your passion. And I began to counsel this way because I understood something. If Jesus isn't Lord of your lives individually, he'll never be Lord of your home collectively. And, uh, and, and so it's true. Men, if you want to lead, if you want to serve, if you want to secure and sustain with power, then seek Christ with all your heart. Uh, make him Lord of your life so that you can love sacrificially. But then finally... There's a third requirement that I give you this morning, and that is that marriage requires loving steadfastness. Verse 31, again, is a repetition of Genesis chapter 2. By the way, to all of those who say that the Old Testament uh, is just a collection of ancient writings, as some preachers are saying today, don't you believe it? Jesus quoted this verse, which comes out of Genesis 2, and Paul quotes it out of Genesis. They thought something about the Old Testament. So, what does he give us here? Well, here's the third requirement. Loving steadfastness. The two shall become one flesh. Now, that's a mystical statement, isn't it? It, 
It, but it reflects this spiritual union that God has designed. A marriage made in heaven is reflected in this verse, this very verse. If you had to pick one verse that identified a marriage made in heaven, this is it. That for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and he shall hold fast or he shall cleave to his wife and the two shall become one uh, flesh. It's math that goes like this. One plus one equals one. I know, I know that's bad math. But it's great theology. And it works. Marriage is more than two people coming together and sharing life. Marriage is a merger of two lives into one life, and that for the purpose and the glory of God. Did you know that word, those words there in uh, hold fast or cleave, depending on what translation you're using, those words denote the idea of, of uh, two people being glued together. They're glued together. And that's the idea, that God wants your life glued to the life of your spouse. And, uh, you know, it's uh, God's super glue kind of thing. Have you ever glued your fingers together? you ever done that with that, that super glue? And uh, it's pretty good, isn't it? It holds really well. Well, God says that that's what he wants you to do in your marriage. He, he says, I want you glued together. And the glue that holds it together is this unconditional sacrificial love that we talked about just a moment ago. Now, in the, in the Scripture, there are three or, uh, ideas of love. In the Greek in particular, there's phileo. We call that a friendship love, a brotherly kind of love. And marriage should have that. There ought to be friendship in marriage. Uh, there's the uh, other uh, expression of love, eros, which means a physical kind of love. And, and certainly, uh, marriage uh, should be characterized by that. But the third Greek word for love is that word agape. We've been talking about that unconditional kind of love, and that's the glue love. That's the, the love that holds it all together. That's the love that causes a relationship to endure. For good or bad, it glues the relationship together. And there are a couple of words that I think help us understand or give us some perspective about this loving steadfastness, this uh, that, that last through the ages. The first is the word commitment. And this is about the priority of marriage. Marriage is more than a feeling. Uh, a meaningful marriage doesn't survive by feelings alone because feelings rise and fall. Feelings are circumstantial. Your marriage will not hold together purely on the basis of feelings. Young couples often think, oh, we just are, we're madly in love, and they are. And you know, if you've been married for a while, you know the old line, yeah, but the honeymoon will be over, you know. When you really begin to understand this person that you're living with, and, and they begin to understand you. And so uh, uh, the priority of ma marriage involves a commitment. Um, it, it requires this agape, unconditional kind of commitment to one another. Um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, while he was in the last days of his life, while he was in prison uh, in Nazi Germany, he wrote a beautiful sermon for the wedding of his niece and one of his dear friends, Eberhard Bethage. And he, he wrote out the sermon. By the way, he never had the chance to preach it because Hitler had him executed 10 days before the war was over. But, but uh, it's a line that has has continued to challenge and be used by many couples. His line was this in his sermon, Today you are young and very much in love, and you think that your love will sustain your marriage. It won't. But your marriage can sustain your love. He's talking about that kind of unconditional love that uh, often is reflected in commitment. In his book on this day, Carl Windsor, for the page on Valentine's Day included this anecdote. Listen to what he said. Even the most devoted couple will experience a stormy bout once in a while. A grandmother who was celebrating her golden wedding anniversary once told the secret of her long and happy marriage. On my wedding day, she said, I decided to make a list of the 10, uh, of ten things uh, which I considered my husband's worst faults and for which I would always overlook. So she said, I made this list of 10 things, these 10 things. If he does any one of these 10 things, I'm, I'm going to overlook those things out of, out of love. 
And she told that, and then a guest then came to her and asked, so what were some of the faults that she had chosen to overlook through the years? To which the grandmother replied, said, well, to be honest, I never did get around to writing them down. But whenever my husband did something that made me hopping mad, I would just say to myself, lucky for him, that's one of the ten. That's what commitment does, doesn't it? The other word that helps us understand this steadfast love is connection. And this is about the permanence of marriage. If commitment is about the priority of marriage, uh, this is about the permanence of marriage. Um, Matthew 19, 6, a verse that I have used and many other preachers have used through the years in wedding ceremonies says, so there are no longer two but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. This is the connection. This is the connection that verse 31 is talking about, that Genesis 2 is talking about, that Jesus is talking about in, in 1916, the two coming, becoming one. Author and business leader Fred Smith wrote and said, one of my most trusted memories comes from a donut shop in Grand Saline, Texas. He says, uh, there was a young farm couple sitting at the table next to mine, And he was wearing overalls, and she had on a gingham dress. And after finishing their donuts, he got up to pay the bill, and I noticed that she didn't get up to follow him. But then he came back, and he stood in front of her. She put her arms around his neck, and he lifted her up, revealing that she was wearing a full body brace. He lifted her out of her chair and then backed out the front door to the pickup truck with her still hanging from his neck. As he gently put her into the truck, everyone in the shop just stopped and watched. No one said anything until finally, as the truck drove away, a waitress remarked almost reverently, he took his vows seriously. You know, tragically today, we have men and women who stand at the marriage altar They make a covenant, not a contract. Listen, marriage before God is a covenant. There's a difference between a covenant and a contract. Men and women today make, stand at the altar, they make covenants before God, and, and then they make a steadfast commitment in their vows, and then something happens and they just walk out. You say, well, I, I owe it to myself to be, to be happy. I believe it was Joe Theismann after his fourth or fifth marriage when they asked him why he was divorcing again, he said, because Joe Theismann deserves to be happy. And maybe you've heard that, maybe not after that many separations or divorces, but maybe you've said to yourself or heard someone say, well, I owe it to myself to be happy. But don't you also owe it to God to be faithful to your promise? Don't you owe it to your spouse? to work hard, to keep your promise? How about your children? Don't you owe it to the children? You say, well, I, I, it, it'll be better for the children if, if we do this. Really? Why don't you ask the children? Why don't you ask them about that? You say, well, well, I've prayed about it, and God told me it was all right. Friend, you're a liar. Because God does not violate his own word. He doesn't transgress his word. The problem with many Christian marriages today is not that people have tried it and failed. The fact is they have not really applied God's principles. They've listened to what the world says. But at the same time, they expect God to bless and make their marriage work. Listen, here's a general rule for God's blessing in your life, in marriage, in anything. Hey, grads, in anything. Listen, this is a general rule. You must do more than acknowledge that God's ways are best. You must apply the principles of God's word and obey them fully. Many marriages, they want the product of God's blessing, 
but they don't want to practice the principles of God for marriage. And it just doesn't work that way. Now, you may be listening to this on live stream or television, hearing it on radio in this live audience, and you may say, my marriage needs work. Well, remember what I told you at the beginning. All marriages require work. And they require work all through the marriage. Marriage is one of those things that is a commitment that is, that is initiated but never completed through the life of the relationship. It is something we continue, always coming, never arriving, but it requires work. Commitment, unconditional, agape kind of love. Your marriage may need work. James Dobson said this, even if marriages are made in heaven, man has to be responsible for their maintenance. That's the way God has designed it. But the good news is, if you say, God, I'm going to take it serious, you're, look, you're broken. I'm broken. We're broken people. You're still, it's going to be challenging at times. Uh, but with God's help, your marriage can thrive. And with commitment and the connection that God gives to us, your marriage can remain and become healthy. But it starts even before marriage. It starts with a commitment. And that is your commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ himself. To trust him. And if you've never done that, I want to invite you to do that. Each week we hear from people that are watching out there and say, I, I trusted Christ as my Savior. Today you can do that. I want to give you that opportunity. I want to invite you now, if you will, to bow your head, close your eyes. No one's looking about in this place. In a moment, we'll have a formal invitation. I'll be at the front, staff will be on the sides, and I'll invite you to slip out to come to one of us. And whatever the decision is, God is impressed upon your heart to share that, and then we'll take it from there. But even before then, I want to invite you, if you've never trusted Christ, or maybe you're not sure you've trusted Christ. You need to settle that. Before you can have a marriage made in heaven, you've got to have a relationship that's connected to heaven. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Today, you can do that. In your heart, right now, wherever you are, in this building, live stream, television, radio, you can call on him. Sincerely, cry out, Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me unconditionally. Thank you for dying for my sins. I know that I'm a sinner, and I know that I need you. So right now, I invite you to come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. and Be my Savior, my Lord, and my Master. Now, Father, I know you hear those prayers. And so, Father, I pray that you'll help those who called on you today to allow you to begin this incredible, transformative, relationship with you so that all the other relationships of their life can be impacted for you and for those relationships. Father, would you move in our moments of invitation in Jesus' name.